I don't think you have to pray if it any points to us. <laughs> you have that oh. power to receive. So today, I'm going to talk to you about special relativity. System, right? This would also be equal to x prime x hat prime plus y prime y hat prime plus z prime um, z hat prime, where, where, where x, x, x prime y prime z prime is another um, right handed coordinate system, all right? So, in other words, the coordinate axes meet at right angles, all right? And you could ask, okay, so great. You have these two different ways of, so either we can, re we can represent P. Represent P either by what? X, Y, Z, or we could represent it by X prime, Y prime, Z prime with the, in, in the other coordinate system, right? Those are the coordinate vectors of this point B. How are these coordinate vectors related? I'm also assuming, for the sake of simplicity of this argument, that these coordinate systems share the same origin. In fact, we know we could do worse things. We could make them have different o origins. But let's just focus here on the case they have an overlapping origin. Yeah. <coughs> By the angles between the axes. Yeah, the angles, well, the angles between, I mean, the angles between the x, y, z axis is going to be different than the angles between the x prime, y prime, z prime axis in general. What? What if you say three angles? Um, well, they could be different three angles. <coughs> One of them could be the same, yes. But, well, no, not even now. Because if I had, for example, just imagine this is the S prime, you know, if you, if you think about just rotating that a little bit and think about the angles set up between these axes versus just the fixed axes, you'd see they don't have to be the same. But there, what did you say? Somebody say something? Yep. I would say the only real relation or commonality between them is that it really does fit that figure. You take the one vector and cross the other, you get one. Take that and cross the other, and you get the other. Does that make any sense? Well, I mean, that, I'm assuming that about this x prime y prime system. I'm assuming x prime cross y prime hat is equal to x prime hat. In other words, that the x y z x y z prime system is a right-handed coordinate system. I'm assuming that. What, what I'm fishing for here 
Is there something geometric? There's something that exists independent of the choice of coordinates, and that's the distance of the point from the origin. You see, the distance from the point to the origin in either system that you choose, you can prove, in fact, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to x prime squared plus y prime squared plus z <coughs> prime squared. That's the invariant between these different um, coordinate systems that are just, you know, share the same, same origin both. And, and you, you, can, you can prove that. Um, but I wouldn't prove it here. I feel like I proved that on a test in junior level mechanics at one point. It was very frustrating. I had a page of tensor calculus, solid, like, dense page of writing. And I look at the professor's solution, it's like three lines. Ah, so annoying. Anyway, okay. I will show you those three lines today. Um, anyway, my point to you is, is that this is, this is our, our starting point, really, is the assumption that we have this Cartesian coordinate system, right? And that we can measure distances. And you know, if I, you know, if I talked about the distance between two points, and I'm talking about with respect to, you know, two systems of coordinates which aren't moving with respect to each other, you you, you know that they're the distance is the same in both, right? I mean, because we're using ortho orthonormal force, actually, but. And then there's something else we've been using all semester, right? Time. Okay. We don't, you know, we have, if we have, we're talking about relative motion, we still use the same universal time for everything, right? Think about it. I mean, we never ask the question, which time are you talking about? Like the moving time or the stationary time? That wasn't even on the, on the, on the, on the realm as a possibility of consideration. And a lot of this, in some sense or another, is due to our starting point for this whole discussion, which ultimately is Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton is the one who really made this mathematical and in some sense, some sense axiomatic. He's the one who said, you know, think about things as functions of time, do calculus with math. Um, I mean, yeah, other people did too also, but uh, I think he really sort of set the boat in motion and just kept sailing from where he started up until about 1905 or so. Well, the late 19th century, we started to understand there were some problems with Newton's idea that there's just one notion of time for a, 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 an observer and a moving observer. Um, for Einstein, who uh, of course is the, uh, the author of special relativity, his, his thing was he did these thought experiments about shining a flashlight on a train, and he just couldn't reconcile um, the usual notion of like uh, velocity is <coughs> adding. So you know, what's the rule for adding velocity for us in, 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 um, in this, this semester? What do we do? If I'm on a train, and the train's going 50 miles per hour that way, right? And I throw a baseball 80 miles an hour that way, because of course I can. But um, if I could, then how fast would the baseball be going that way? Relative to you. Relative, yeah, relative <laughs> to who is a good question. Relative to you guys who are not in the train, you're just watching. Right, the train speed plus my speed, like 130 <coughs> miles an hour. Right, so I'm saying it's like, well, if you had a flashlight and you're on a train, the train's going to speed of light or whatever, half the speed of light, and and and, the, and the, you shine the flashlight, then the flashlight would be going speed of light, speed of light plus another half speed of light, right? And then through thinking about different scenarios that could happen there, he became convinced that that was an impossibility. I'm not going to try to explain why it's impossible. I remember sometime when I was about six, I convinced myself if you could do that, you could do time travel. I forget the argument, but I don't know. If you think about it long enough, you can come up with kind of crazy things you could do in terms of signaling people ahead of time. It, it, <laughs> anyway, long story short, Einstein became suspicious of Newton's notion of universal time. He said, well, maybe, maybe, there's, maybe we shouldn't assume that time is the same for all observers, right? And so, in 1905, he came up with a new, a new system of mechanics. And his, his notion of mechanics, and, and you know, other people, there are other results which were troubling. Um, in, in, um, in the study of electromagnetics, in about 1860 or so, Maxwell corrected 
the equations which existed by adding the term which we call the displacement term, Maxwell's correction, um, Van Peer's law. And Maxwell's correction, Van Peer's law, what it did was it brought a new symmetry between the electric and magnetic fields. And what it ends up saying is that the electromagnetic field in a vacuum can satisfy a wave equation. Actually, each component of the electric and magnetic fields, all six of them, separately satisfy the same equations. The same equation is like a rope, um, you know, like a wave of a rope. And so, shortly thereafter, Hertz and others, they came up with these things called radios, right? And we found out not only were those wave equations <coughs> mathematically feasible, they're actually physically realizable. And we understand now that light, in fact, is an electromagnetic wave. But if it's an electromagnetic wave, you could look at the equations um, that come from Maxwell's equations we'll study next semester. And sitting just right there in the derivation is the speed of the wave. And the speed of the wave appear mathematically just to depend on the fundamental properties of permittivity and permeability of space. The speed of light actually is the square root, like one of the square root of mu naught times epsilon naught. You'd say, well, with respect to which frame of reference, right? Because the speed of a wave surely depends on how fast the thing is, is emitting it goes. That's the thing. There is no mechanism for that in the equations. There's no seeming need to account for how fast the thing emitting the light was moving. It, it, it seems to say, the equations, Maxwell's equations seem to say, if you just look at them and just take it for face value, they seem to say that the speed of light is independent of the speed of which it's being emitted. <coughs> That's very troubling in view of the thing we just talked about in terms of how high velocities add mechanics. How do you square those two things? On the one hand, you have a light which is independent in terms of the speed of the emitter of the light, and on the other, on the, on the other side, things have Additional velocities like we talked about this semester. The, the relativity I was just describing, or I haven't quite described, actually goes back to Galileo. I mean, he, he kind of, Galileo predates Newton, right? I, okay, fine. I mean, I guess he was the kind of one who really started it, because he did experiments and kind of freed our minds from Aristotle. And his, you know, heavy stuff falls faster nonsense. Um, sounds good on paper, right? But you actually do the math and the experiments, it kind of breaks down. Anyway. So my, my point was, it was in the water. I mean, in 1880 or so, these radios and things were starting to be the early, you know, early technology of radios was, was there and started. And we were starting to understand that light was just another, you know, another electromagnetic wave, all that. So how do you square that with the mechanics, which has been known since the time of Newton? And mechanics was successful, right? Explain the motion of the solar system, all the stuff, right? Very successful, what we've done. You've seen how it's useful to describe motion around you. And yet, it seems inconsistent with some other things. So what do you do? Well, what Einstein did was he said, well, I mean, you got, you got three choices, right? And here, if you're going to read more about this, I highly recommend this book. This is Introduction to Special Relativity by uh, Robert Resnick. Um, and uh, so here's what he says. There's really three choices once you realize that there's trouble. How do, you, how, do you, how do you modify mechanics to address this problem? Here's the three choices, he says. A relativity principle exists for mechanics, but not for electrodynamics. In electrodynamics, there's a preferred inertial frame, and we'll call that the ether frame, this so-called luminous first ether. Uh, should this alternative be correct, the Galilean transformations would still apply, but it's just a special, special circumstance of how light propagates from the ether frame that explains this universal property we see for light. Okay. That's the ether frame hypothesis. Number two, a relativity principle exists both for mechanics and electrodynamics, but the laws of electrodynamics given by Maxwell are not correct. <laughs> if this alternative were correct, we ought to be able to perform experiments which show deviation from Maxwell's electrodynamics and reformulate the electromagnetic laws. Bad news here. It turns out Maxwell's equations were, in fact, correct. We're still teaching to you next semester, more or less. Number three, relativity principle exists both for mechanics and electrodynamics. But the laws of mechanics, as given by Newton, are not correct. If this alternative is the correct one, we should be able to perform experiments which show deviations from Newtonian mechanics and reformulate, reformulate mechanical laws. In that event, the correct transformation laws would not be the Galilean ones, addition of velocities, for example, simple relations between space and space without regard to time. But instead, <coughs> if, if, if these are the correct transformation laws, they would not be the Galilean ones, but they are inconsistent with the invariant Spectrum's equations but some other ones that are consistent with electromagnetism and the new mechanics. Okay, so, and then, 
obviously uh, option three is what Einstein chose, and it uh, basically comes down to he has a couple axioms. Um, so the axioms, Einstein's axioms, oh, I can't spell. Mr. <laughs> Stein, Einstein's axioms. So basically his axioms, that this is the starting point. This is what I see as being needed. So I mean, kind of, other people were trying to fix mechanics by making all these kinds of like ad hoc assumptions. Just saying, well, if this thing is happening, then there's these extra rules that apply, right? Einstein's approach is much more like <coughs> mathematical, really. He, uh, he saw the problems and he made them part of his definition and went from there <laughs> in some sense or another. So one, and I, I, may be, I may not be putting these in the proper numbering. I forget what the proper numbering is, but we'll get them anyway. Um, Laws of mechanics same for all inertial frames. And let me put inertial in quotes because it's not any longer, it's not the notion we already have. We're talking about a new notion of what's inertial. Number two, speed of light. Same for all observers. Um, that is frames of reference. I mean, so we have this notion of being able to set up a frame of reference. Um, essentially, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about these two things interchangeably. The people have cut these ideas very finely if you read various books. I'm not going to be so careful in here. Let's just say that an inertial, inertial frame is some method of setting up a coordinate system. For the most part, we'll just think two-dimensional because that's enough to get the idea across. So you can set up you know, an x, a y, I guess we'll find z. And um, then also, you can somehow measure time with respect to this, this system of clocks. Now, as he describes in here, you can't really think about taking a bucket of clocks at the uh, at the origin and like synchronizing them and then moving them around that kind of begs a lot of the questions we're trying to get around answering. So what you got to do is you got to take all these clocks in principle and put them everywhere and then send light signals to these distances which are known and then you can sync up the the clocks in such a way. Something like that is how you set up this inertial frame of reference. Um, but anyway, pretty much we just believe that that could be done only. I don't know. Maybe we believe it can be done. Um, so, actually, the, the assumption of the existence of an inertial frame of reference is actually philosophically kind of a big deal. Anyway, that said, you have these inertial frames of reference. The speed of light should be the same for all observers. And I'm trying to remember. I think those, those are the big ones. I don't know if there's anything more, really. That's kind of it. Maybe three, these should reduce. The Newtonian mechanics at the limit of small velocities between the frames. So, if you have two, two, if you have two frames of reference, I mean, I would add this as a three, because I think I, at least I need to use it when I derive the Lorentz <coughs> transformations. Um, you know, if let's say t prime x prime and t, I guess I could find I can I can afford some writing t prime x prime y prime. Z prime and T X Y Z. Um, are measured with respect to let's say S prime and S <coughs> where S prime moves with speed B with respect to S, right? So suppose to draw a picture of what I'm trying to get at here. Here's your S frame. 
here's your S prime frame. And the S prime frame usually will just think about moving with velocity v in the, uh, um, in the x direction. All right. Okay. And we also usually assume that at time zero, the, uh, the origins of these two frames coincide just to keep it uncluttered. So with that assumption, what? What should happen if V is, is, is much, much less than C, then what? I'm saying, this, suppose the speed is much less than the speed of light. In other words, it's like our everyday ordinary experience. What should we discover? We should discover that this new mechanics reduces to the old mechanics in as much as we can compare. Because the old mechanics has been very successful at low speeds. Right? So, and thus we're going to also change the meaning of x, y, and z, and x prime, y prime, z prime. We don't have any intention of doing that. I still want those to be orthonormal Cartesian coordinate systems. You know, I still, yeah. So is the only way to really test this is to get something that's going the speed of light? Right. Yeah, to see real aberrations from Newtonian mechanics, we need to look at things that have high speed. There are some sneaky exceptions to this, but yes. Um, by high speed, with reference to what is the first question, and the other is, do we see examples of that? So high speed with respect to the speed of light, but does that mean that we look at the speed of light and see how fast light is passing the object? Speed of light is C. I know. And then all of this is done with respect to, by the way, um, the speed of light can change when you go from one medium to another. So, by the way, the backdrop of this whole discussion is a vacuum. All right, This is all happening in a vacuum. We're talking about different frames of reference for a given segment of space, just empty space, yeah. Because my question really is how, how do we measure the velocity of an object with respect to the speed of light? Do we just have one movement? We, measure, and well, we, we, don't, we don't measure velocity of an object with respect to the speed of light. We measure a velocity of an object with respect to an inertial frame. As, as laid out in calculus, you know, d, d, dx dt, dy dt, dz dt. We still do all those things <coughs> in a fixed inertial frame. The weird thing is that we can't just like the earlier, our, our, our derivation of Galilean, as it's called, relativity, is like stupidly simple. <coughs> I did it the first week, it wasn't a big deal. Basically, we just had our, um, I mean, in our current, I, ha I shifted the origin, right? I mean, I'm not even, um, that was the relation between, and so in short, like, in this notation, actually just be R equals R prime. I mean, we're thinking of R as the geometric. R has contained in it both the basis factors and the coordinates, if you know what that means, you know, it's okay. But then our, 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 our derivation for velocities relation was like the R to T. Right? <laughs> dr dt plus dr prime dt, you know? And that was, so v was equal to the velocity of the origin plus the velocity measured in the prime frame. That's the relation of velocity. Why is that so simple? It's so simple because same time. And so that's the, we're still going to measure velocity in a given frame of reference the same way we always did. But what's difference is, difference is we're not going to assume that we can calculate the velocity using the same time in both frames, and that's the thing that leads to the weird new results. <laughs> but anyway, this is certainly an assumption. If the velocity is much lower than can see, we should be able to recover these sorts of things in, in that limit. So for example, one of the things you should have is that T prime is, is basically the same as T. You shouldn't really have any noticeable distinction between times measured by two observers, which aren't really that different in terms of their speed relative to one to another. Which is good. Because it's certainly not common to our everyday experience to go, I'll see you in a half hour, and then you're like, well, okay, honey, but what frame of reference? You know? I mean, you can tell the cop that you weren't speeding relative to a certain frame of reference, but I tend to think it's not going to help you, at least most of us. Subset of cops who are proper nerds in order to appreciate this is a small, small indeed. And even of those, you probably did it already to the tire. 
Oh, okay, so anyway, getting to the point. You can derive, <coughs> consistent with these axioms, the following relations. Here's it goes. So we're going to assume, assume that S prime moves with speed V with respect to S. <coughs> and so here, uh, in the x direction. So it's just like the picture I was, I was drawing here. It turns out that the transformations between the moving frame of reference <coughs> and, the, and the initial frame of reference, so if I, if I say, and we can talk about space-time events, right? So we have, we have two events, consider. So in S prime, we have event uh, T prime, X prime, Y prime, Z prime. And then in S, we have event um, T, X, Y, Z. I'm assuming, I'm assuming, though, that these are, in fact, the same event, the same point in space <coughs> time, right? So what I'm trying to say is X prime, Y prime, Z prime, T prime, and T, X, Y, Z, these are describing the same <coughs> space and time, right? The question is, how are these different choices of coordinates related? So this would be the analog of, I was talking about x, y, z versus x prime, y prime, z prime, describing the same point in space. We didn't talk about time. Here, here are the relations. If I was to write out the actual relations between the rotated coordinate system and the coordinate system, there'd be a rotation that related the two that that you could draw which is like a three by three matrix which satisfies a very particular equation. They're not, they're, they're, they're well studied in your algebra, for example. Anyway, here it is. Use a, and you can derive these. X prime, well, let me do that. Yeah, fine. So X prime, equals to x minus vt over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. <coughs> y prime is equal to y. Z prime is equal to, in other words, nothing happens with y and z because we're talking about what's called, I mean, this is, this is known as, so uh, people would say that, that s prime <coughs> is x boosted x boosted from s. That's the language. It's an it x boost. A boost is a velocity transformation. And so y and z doesn't change, but t prime, now there's the, there's the thing. t prime is equal to t minus v divided by c squared times x divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And sometimes it's useful to have the reverse transformations, how to go from x to x prime, the other around x prime x. So the, the, um, the, <coughs> first, the, first, the, the inverse transformations of this, x is equal to x prime plus v t prime divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Um, y is equal to y prime, z is equal to z prime, those are easy. And t is equal to t prime plus v divided by c squared times x prime divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And you start to see that there's this, uh, there's this factor appearing everywhere, right? You see that factor start to show up everywhere? So it's useful to have a, a location for that. You can you can have a definition gamma um, is equal to one over the square root of one minus v squared over c squared. <coughs> so generically speaking, if you wanted me to describe what happens in the equations of relativity like pretty quick, 
I would say this, you insert a gamma a bunch of places, and that gamma factor is usually one. In fact, well, it's, it's, it's one in our usual context. When V is much, much smaller than C, V over C is stupidly small, and, and V squared over C squared is smaller still, so one over the square root of one is well, just one. So that, 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 that gamma factor just becomes one, right? And um, when gamma is just one, you're back to just the, the Galilean results, right? X prime is equal to X minus Vt. Like without this, that's what we have before in this situation, right? Just to be clear, I mean, if you've got, if you've got this, this guy sitting here, S, right? And then this other frame of reference, let's pick this point, talk about that point. Um, well, we need to talk about, so you talk about another point right here. Then this would be y prime, this distance would be x prime, right? This, since we're assuming that they overlap, since we're assuming that these, these coordinate systems overlap at time zero, where the origin of s prime is at time t is what? It's just, it's just Vt. Speed times time gives me how far over the S prime frame moves at time t as relative as it measured in S. And so I have the equation x is what? x is equal to x prime plus Vt. Right? <coughs> well, maybe I should look at this one. Now the reason that's wrong is because I'm assuming time is the same for both. But anyway, you can see that if time were the same for both, it reduces to that. Now you have a way of thinking. Yes, sir. Is it mean that like this means that also in the past is like a common just when you're given the half that you can have this where you just create time? I don't know. If you can write an equation, does it bend the world of reality? If you can write an equation which is true for all the experiments we do, does it bound God? I don't think so. But as far as I know, in the physics that we know, you can't go faster than the speed of light. So. Going faster than the speed of light would call into question the basic rules of relativity. It'd be a big deal. <coughs> so generically speaking, when the invariable science story comes out every year saying such and such found that they can go faster than the speed of light in their lab, I just kind of go, I've heard this story like every three years. With the follow-up, less advertised story, sorry guys, we miscalculated our results and misinterpreted the ways of velocity as the current velocity of vice versa. It's the same thing every time. And science journalists don't really care about the sensation, non-sensational follow-up. By the way, relativity still works, yeah. Um, is that given just because that we'd be dividing by a non-real answer? Non-real, non-real number. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, x and y and z and z prime. All these things. These are real coordinates. Uh -huh. So there's no room for imaginary numbers in this. At least, unless we're going to really expand our mind. I mean, I mean that, that would be something else altogether. I don't know what that would mean. Um, okay. So now you can say, well, why are these true? Fair. Fair enough. I will tell you this, that there's experimental evidence against the ether hypothesis. That was 1896's Michelson-Morley experiment. What they did was they, um, you know, they, had, they took measurements while we were on one side of the sun and while we were on the other side of the sun, like six months apart. And so if there was this like luminiferous ether that was everywhere throughout the cosmos and the light was propagating with respect to that, <coughs> there's something called the Doppler effect. You should be able to see um, a difference in certain optics when you're going one way with respect to the medium versus when you're going another way with respect to the medium. And anyway, there should have been a difference between these six months apart, and there was just no difference. So that pretty much killed, killed the ether hypothesis that, that did. Um, but apparently Einstein was not really aware of that result. I mean, he was loosely aware of it, but his reason for writing these equations down was more, more theoretical. I guess the first thing to check, if you, if you want to see if these equations are reasonable or not, you want to see, are the equations, is the speed of light the same in both frames of reference, right? So how, would you, how would you write the equation of, uh, of a light ray in, say, the S system?
So let's see here. I would say x is equal to c times p. That's the, that is the equation that says I have x. This is the coordinate of the light. And if you go time t, it's gone to ct <coughs> distance. Right? It says you have light speed, where c is the speed of light. If you like, c is about 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. All right. It's 2.985, whatever, 3. OK, so then transform. What does that, what does that give you? That gives you what? Like, if I switch this over to the prime coordinates, what do I get? I guess I should say this. Um, t is equal to t. <laughs> um, I need, maybe I need to invent a parameter here to see better what's going on. Yeah, I don't know. Let's see here. What's x prime? Then? x prime is equal to what? It's equal to x minus vt, right? But what is x minus vt? Remember x is cp, so we get what? We get c minus v. I can factor out the t. But I also need to, to be fair, in order to put this equation in the prime frame, I also have to modify what? Would I measure the velocity of something in the prime frame with the unprimed time? No, that's what I'm trying to tell you. You have to use the prime frame to measure velocity. Uh, you have to use the prime time. <laughs> prime time. So how do we get prime time? You guys don't care about prime time anymore. You guys get that. See here. So t is what? T is this thing. <coughs> so let's see here. This would be equal to c minus v over the square root. 1 minus v squared over c squared. And t would be what we got. We got t prime plus v over c squared. I thought I did the wrong here. I think I made it more complicated than it needs to be. I'm not sure what I did wrong yet. Ugh. Well, I guess if I take my medicine, I gotta do algebra here and solve for x prime. Right? I gotta get the x prime over there. All right. So I would have what? I would have x prime <coughs> minus what? If you, if you subtract this x prime term with all that, what do you got? You've got c minus v divided by that, all right? Square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared squared, right? See that? <coughs> so I have that. Like that. Gives me one over the square of that, that squared. I got the v over c squared. I subtract it, and that's all equal to what? That's equal to c minus v over the square root of one minus v squared over c squared. And I got myself t prime there. Right? You guys follow my algebra? So what I'm doing is I'm just trying to isolate. I'm trying to solve put x prime on one side prime on the other side and find the relation between them. What are we hoping to find? If the speed of light is c in the prime frame, what equation should we get? Like just the same, right? But with primes. Just looks looks a little daunting, right? So what's this? X prime. Here, that's 1 minus c minus v over 1 minus v squared over c squared. Hmm. Let me just stop and take a breath here before I do any more algebra. Let me figure out what it is. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I was trying to. Um, this is x prime times 1 minus that. Okay. See what I did? So, 
I've got this that's right here. <coughs> all this stuff, all this stuff. So I multiplied it and subtracted it to the other side. Now I, I, I think I'm gonna get rid of the square root of square and write that a little more civilized. That's really this, right? Maybe we should make a common denominator, yeah? Where would that be? for now. I'll come back to this next time. Let me show you something simpler in the time that remains. I've worked this out before. It's not complicated. It's just not doing something silly today. I'm not sure what. to the observer. When it moves with a velocity v relative to the observer, its measured length is contracted in the direction of its motion by the factor of the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, whereas its dimensions perpendicular to the direction of motion are unaffected. Okay, so here's the argument. It won't take us too long. Um, so we have to imagine a rod lying at rest along the x prime axis of the s frame. And uh, we'll, 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 so in, in the S prime frame, we'll, we'll imagine we have a, a, a rod at rest, and it's got endpoints x1 prime, x2 prime, right? And um, so its rest length is what? x2 prime minus x1 prime. Now, the question is, what is the rod, um, what's the rod's length measured by the S frame then, All right, which moves with relative speed v? Um, so we have, <coughs> you can calculate x2 prime minus x1 prime, right, and plug in those Lorentz transformations, which um, Here. So what happens if you have x2 
prime minus x1 prime, which again should be the length of this as measured in the prime frame, right? And that's equal to what? So I have x1 minus vt1. This is all divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, right? So that minus what? With twos, right? I mean with ones, right? x1 minus vt1. I'm sorry, this should be what? <coughs> Two, right, thank you. Okay, so what's that give us? That gives us x2 minus x1 minus v times t2 minus t1 all divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Now, <coughs> if we're measuring <coughs> from the um, <coughs> So he says, he says, now the length of the rod of the S prime is simply the distance between the points x2 and x1 of the moving rod measured at the same instant in that frame, right? So if the rod is moving and we're going to measure the length of the rod in the S frame, we do it at what? T1 equals to T2. Right? You don't, you don't measure the ruler's lengths at different times, right? You measure the length of the ruler at the same time. So T1 equals to T2, so that makes this be 0. And so therefore what? We have x2 prime minus x1 prime is equal to x2 minus x1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. Or, if you like, we could rewrite that as x2 minus x1 is equal to the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared um, times x2 prime minus x1 prime. <coughs> this is so-called length contraction. <coughs> what does this equation say? It says what I said a minute ago here. It says that um, says that the measured length is contracted in the direction of its motion by a factor of the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. So the body's length is measured to be greater than when it is at rest. Factor, one square root of one minus v squared over c squared. You're taking one and you're subtracting a number less than one to so the square root of fraction, which is smaller than one. So what that says is that if this is the rest length, the x2 prime minus x1 prime, the rest length times this factor less than one is giving you the reserve length. So what this says is that when when you have things moving, the actual distance as is measured by the thing which is moving relative to its own rest frame will be longer than what you measure. There's a corresponding result for times. So time dilation um, is, is the flip side of this. And to answer one of your questions earlier, that's one of the main ways we know we've observed relativity lots of times. Um, there's certain quantum mechanical arguments which say that um, you know, uh, a certain particle has a, has a lifetime. It's unstable, all right? There's this weak force that makes things decay. And certain particles have like a characteristic lifetime of like a millisecond or something like that. And yet, we've seen that when they move really, really fast, their lifetimes are like a couple seconds or something. So they're greatly extended. The time is dilated because they're moving very fast. So they still are only existing a millisecond in their own moving frame of reference. But in our fixed frame of reference, where we're watching them move, they exist a lot longer time. And so that's one of the main um, ways we've observed this. Because we have, we have things that we have like no fixed times of existence. And, we can see that the time of existence is longer in our frame of reference where it's moving versus 
if it was just sitting in a lab not moving, it would not exist as long. Okay. Is that radical why you say that we can't go fashion and speed of light? Because otherwise it becomes imaginary. I don't know, like it's it's an axiom, it's the starting point here really. So and to me asking why we can't go to fashion and speed of light in physics be sort of asking like, why can we add vectors in the vector space? I don't know, it's a vector space, it's really works. I mean, maybe that's not a very good physical answer. But um, as far as we know, no. Now there's wormholes and those time-like loops. We've all seen Interstellar. So. Did you like it? Yes, very much so. <laughs> anyway, I will try to derive the time dilation next class, and I'll show you these things called space-time diagrams. And I will also, hopefully, return to the thing I started with and show you what is, in fact, an invariant between these different frames of reference. So I showed you length was an invariant in Galen. There is something that's invariant between SNS prime that you can, you can always compare different frames in terms of what it